morning and welcome to Cedardale. We're so pleased you've come to join us in worship again today. We have our pastor away this week and Jim Sampson, one of our longtime members, will be bringing a message for us today. So we're very thankful that Jim was able and willing to step in. Next week, the pastor Grant will be back again with us and we're looking forward to a wonderful time then. And today as well. Uh, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for all your goodness, grace, and mercy. We thank you that you have called us to be your children. You chose us. You rescued us. You redeemed us. And we can never pay the debt that we owe to you. We want to raise our praise and worship you today because you are our true and holy Father. We want to let this word today go out into all the world and whichever hearts hear this message, may it touch them and may it spark in them and encourage them and bring them closer to you. For this is what we desire, and we know this is your desire, that none should perish. So Lord, we raise this all up to you, and we give you all the, all the glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, today... This week is our week to remind you that uh, this is Faith Promise Week and it is uh, Stewardship Sunday. So this is the week we just remind you that we are the church, you and I, and uh, we need to be active and participating. And that's what we want to encourage you in today whether you give of your time, your talents, or your finances, however the Lord directs you, that's what you need to do to be happy and vibrant. And Jim will touch upon that in his uh, message later on. But before Jim comes to speak, I'd like to read you today's scripture. And it is found in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4, and then I'll skip down to verses 12 to 15. And it says, You were raised from death with Christ. So aim at what is in heaven, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Think only about the things in heaven, not the things on earth. Your old sinful self has died, and your new life is kept with Christ in God. Christ is your life. When he comes again, you will share in his glory. For God has chosen you and made you his holy people. He loves you, so always do these things. Show mercy to others. Be kind, be humble, gentle, and patient. Do not be angry with each other. But forgive one another. If someone does wrong to you, then forgive him. Forgive each other because the Lord forgave you. Do all these things, but most important, love each other. Love is what holds you all together in perfect unity. Let the peace that Christ gives you control your thinking. You were all called together in one body to have peace. Always be thankful. And precious Lord, we certainly are thankful. Thankful for all your care, for all your intervention, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we ask you to remind us daily of that as we seek to serve you, 
and glorify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So that's today's word. And uh, I'll let Jim come and speak to us now. I'm Jim Sampson, and I'm with Cedardale Church of the Nazarene. Our senior pastor, Reverend Grant Verdol, is away today, and he's asked me to do a devotion in his place. So that's why I'm here. Welcome to Cedardale online service. We go out through all the world, so we're glad you're with us. This is more of a confession or a reminder to myself. Sometimes I need to be refreshed in what is required of me as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And this presentation is about that, that you and I are citizens of the kingdom of God. And uh, so I need this information for myself. Now, if the shoe fits and you have to put that shoe on, don't be mad. There's no intentions here, but I have to remind myself of where my place is as a citizen of the kingdom of God. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we worship your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. And we ask you, Lord, to be with us in this time. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you will speak through your servant, that your word will go out and not come back void. This is for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to read a little bit more of Philippians 3, 17, 21, if I may. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, the wonderful and good news of this is, one of these days, brothers and sisters, we're going to receive a brand new body. As the scripture says, we'll be sown in imperfection or buried in imperfection, and we will rise in perfection. We're going to have a body like Christ's own body, and we're not going to suffer anymore. And the beautiful thing about that is, is this, your spirit, which is your life, together with the Holy Spirit, and your soul, which is your identity, will be placed in that new unit, that new body. So isn't that exciting? And we will be raised in perfection forever to be with the Lord in perfection. So we got a lot to look forward to. So if anything I say here gets you down, remember, go all the way back to the beginning of this. Now, if you were fortunate enough to listen to Stephanie Fontaine's sermon last week on grace, You'll know how we got to a place of being the citizens of the kingdom of God or where we are now. Once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our savior and God has deposited the spirit of, of his spirit in us, then we are now citizens and we are saved, saved from God's wrath, quite frankly, saved from destruction or hell. We now are children of God and we have a loving and forgiving father. So she explained beautifully and adequately how we live in a, a, a place of grace, and we should continue on in that place of grace all the time. So this talk is a bit of an extension of Stephanie's word last week. I urge you to take a look at it and listen to it if you can. How then are we to behave as the saved, especially towards one another? Over the past two plus years, we've gone through all kinds of difficult things, all kinds of arguments, all kinds of choices, We've been cooped up for over two years, and a lot of things have happened in the world that can get us down, and that can divide us, because everybody has an opinion. COVID-19 with its variants, you know, is it a, 
uh, mandates or no mandates, what's best? Uh, being co cooped up, we see all of this and we see all kinds of opinions on, the, on TV, on radio, on internet, and just with friends. Uh, is it a pandemic or is it a plandemic? The truckers convoy, freedom fighters or troublemakers? The far right evangelists versus mainstream media? Fake news perhaps? Or perhaps it's religion getting too immersed in politics. We have arguments, people fighting like never before. We are divided. But as brothers and sisters, we don't need to have that kind of a world. When we come together, and I urge everybody to come together, do not forsake coming together as some in the habit of doing. Everybody, We should come together and encourage one another. We have the Russian-Ukraine war, which is causing anxiety, and we're we are not to be anxious for anything, Philippians 4, 7. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, Matthew 6, 34. And that's good advice. We cannot change which is what is going on over in Ukraine. So we don't worry. We shouldn't be anxious about it, but we should bring everything to the Lord in prayer and with thanksgiving, quite frankly, and we'll let the Lord deal with these things. We should live for the day we're in, and we can live in that wonderful grace that Stephanie talked about last week. We are in the world. At the same time, we must come out of the world. We are citizens of the kingdom and, and have become like ambassadors of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is a real lesson for myself because sometimes I'm short-wicked. And sometimes I get sucked into arguments and discussions and I regret it. I go to the Lord and I ask forgiveness. I say, please understand. And he does. He's wonderful that way. Jesus is with the Father now and his Holy Spirit is within us. We, the church, have become his body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. It's like Jesus, when he was here, he walked among us. Now he went to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit with us. He still is among us through his spirit, but we now are his legs, his feet, his ears, his mouth, his eyes. And we're here to serve one another and serve the people of the world with the glorious message of the gospel. And of course, we are servants of Christ at the same time, children of Christ. And again, our bodies are the spirit. The bodies, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. We should keep that in mind always. Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hindered by sin's deceitfulness. Hebrews 3, 13, 15. Not to be deceived by the evil that is in the world. A best way to do that is collectively come together and talk to other believers. I have an opportunity every Wednesday to get together with some some of the church online for a Bible study. Sometimes I'm busy. Sometimes I have other things I, I could do. But every time I do go to that Bible study, and it only takes about an hour, and we talk, and we pray, and we discuss uh, various aspects of our faith and our belief in God, I always come out better for it. Always. What is the kingdom? In essence, the kingdom of God is basically God's rule over the earth. And that is coming, and it's going to come, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the kingdom of God is within us as well in the form of the Holy Spirit. We started with Christ's coming, that's when it started. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke eleven twenty. The kingdom of God has come upon us, and he's still with us now. Jesus preached that the kingdom of God had arrived and that was proven by many miracles especially the casting out of demons showing the redemptive rule of god had invaded the realm of satan in the old testament the kingdom was basically given to david or under david but that ended with the destruction of jerusalem second samuel 7 8 6. so what should our attitude be as citizens of the kingdom well there's some basics and I must say that a lot of what you hear today, you've probably heard before from me, but this is a, a put on my heart anew, afresh by God. 
But there are basics to how we should be as part of the kingdom of God. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself. Good place to start. We all have a calling. The Lord speaks to our hearts. We're a part of the family of God. So we all have to understand when we're collectively getting together, say in a meeting or a board meeting or wherever, everybody is as valuable as the person next to them. We're all under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Another basic, have confidence in your leader and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Hebrews 13, 17. Do this so it'll be a joy. We should be a joy to each other and we should also be a joy to our pastor. And a part of this is something that I think uh, does bring my pastor to, to mind, the Reverend Verdol. And maybe it's a good time to bring up the love passage. Love, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Keeps no records of wrongs. And sometimes that's how I feel our pastor seems to be very forgiving. That's the impression I get. And if he's like any of the pastors I've been under, which have been three now, I know every now and then their feelings get hurt, but he can let it go. And that's what we should do as well. Let it go. Sometimes we expect too much for our pastor and not enough of ourselves. And again, this is about the kingdom of God. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit, a message of wisdom. To another, a message of of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Sometimes we feel the one man that we have hired to speak the sermon on a Sunday is supposed to be all things to all people. But really, in reality, none of us are all things to everybody. No doubt, if this message here, which is meant to be uh, sent out by the Spirit of God for the good, Someone may not like it or be offended by it. We cannot please everybody. It's just something we can't do. And uh, so I don't think we should put that on our pastor either. We are given the gifts of the Spirit, all that I just listed. And that is for the edification of the church, to, to build up the church. That's one of the reasons why I'm so convicted on the fact that we should remember that scripture that says, do not forsake coming together as some are in the habit of doing. Because where are you going to apply these gifts of the Spirit? They're supposed to be for the church. They're supposed to be for Christ's people, for the people of the kingdom of God. That's what they're supposed to be. Kind of hard to do that when you're not getting together with people. How should we act or be then? Well, toward one another, we are brothers and sisters. We are family. And we should be a family, not of quarreling siblings. I know Every now and then there's families. I know brothers that no, don't even talk to each other, but we shouldn't be like that. Accept one, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. I have a, an acquaintance that I run into every now and then. And whenever I run into him, especially if there's other people around, he'll always bring up, always bring up disputable matters. He likes the argument. He likes the fighting. He likes the voices rising up and people getting passionate. And as I said earlier before, sometimes I can have a short wick, and then I, but I don't want that. We shouldn't be bringing up things that are gonna be disputable. 
That's you are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. I like this and I underlined a couple of things. Are you not worldly? I think that's another confirmation that we're supposed to not be worldly. We're supposed to be the new creation in Christ. We're supposed to be the people of God, people of the kingdom. And the other thing I like to point out is it says, are you not acting like mere humans? Mere human sounds like being born again really means we are a new creation in Christ. Wouldn't you think so? Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 again. How should we act towards one another? Well, if we talk badly about the church outside of the church, why would people want to be a part of the family? This brings us to how we are perceived by the world. Don't speak well about the pastor. Why would people want to join us? Don't speak well about each other. Why would people want to be a part of the congregation like that? Why would they want to attend church? Do we complain about the work we do? People will think it's just another chore. Begrudgingly give of your time and finances. Well, if we, be, you know, each of it says here in the scripture, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a, chief, a, a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. I know it's hard because some people, especially in the church I attend, with the numbers, when their numbers are low, there's only a few people that do way more of the work than the average, and God bless them. And I'm grateful to God for it. But we got to think about that. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart. You have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a, cheer, a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9.7 Personally, there's a couple of things I feel if you're talking about giving or tithes or offerings. I personally feel if I put conditions on my offerings or the monies I give and I put conditions on that, I don't feel like I've given anything to God. It's just how I feel. I'm not saying you feel that way. And as I said, this is more of a talk toward myself, but if the shoe fits, because we give the money, our offerings, according to what's put on our heart, what we put on our heart to give, we give that to God. And that's where it should end. And then the board, which we've elected under the pastor, they, just, they, they decide where that money should go. So I don't like conditions. I don't tell people I have to go to church. I don't like to do that. I like to tell people, no, I'm going to church. And if they say, oh, you have to go to church, I go, no, I want to be in church. I think that's important of us because we're trying to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we should be trying to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ always. So what does God, what does Jesus want from us? To love one another, to love God, and to grow in the spirit. How then do we measure our personal growth? Well, here's how I kind of measure it. By the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you poor in spirit? There's a good chance you will be if you're a part of the kingdom of God, because you're going to see the evil in the world. It's going to make you poor in spirit, desiring peace. Look what's happening in your Ukraine. We desire peace, so we get hurt and we feel it. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Of course we mourn. We mourn for people we don't even know. I even feel bad about the Russian soldiers in tanks being blown up and killed. I mourn for their families you know, that they suffer like this. But that's part of being a part of the kingdom of God. You'll feel that way or will grow into feeling that way. For we will be comforted, says the word of God. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You know, there's a lot of people who are, I call them chest puffers, but everybody thinks they've got to be powerful, big and out there and strong. And uh, But the word says that we should be meek. For they will inherit the earth. 
We should be meek. The Bible also tells us, let your gentleness be known. Not your macho-ness. Let your gentleness be known. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You ever just wish you were better? You ever just wish that you could be more pleasing to God? You ever done something you're ashamed of? Part of that is hungering for righteousness, is regretting what you've done, and you want more of what God wants for you. You want more of what pleases Him. The good news is, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I remember the Lord saying to the Pharisees after a man was healed in the temple <clears throat> and Jesus, and they were all upset, the Pharisees were all upset. And Jesus said, go and learn this. I love mercy over sacrifice. We know that scripture says mercy covers a multitude of sins. And I also apply that to don't hold grudges. Don't remember the wrongs that other people have done. Forgive because you want to be forgiven. That's how I look at that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. David comes out of this for me when the scripture says David was a man after God's own heart. I think as we grow in Christianity and grow in the spirit, we will seek God's own heart. And how, how I mean that is, if we're pure in heart, our desires are not contrived. They're not, there's no schedule, no, we're not planning something. We're not doing something wrong. Our motives are right. We, you know, if we're serving in the church and we're doing something, our motives are right. I believe that's pure in heart. And every now and then we'll mess up. That's why we need forgiveness seven times 70 daily. But I do believe that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I like this one too, because especially now, when we're seeing all kinds of arguments and discussions about everything there seems to be to discuss. The divisions in the world are unbelievable. The divisions in family, the divisions in attitudes and perceptions and everything are so evident. We are to be the ones that go down that middle and try to make peace. We're trying to reconcile. We are the peacemakers. That's one of our purposes here in on the earth at this particular time. They will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Real quick story, and I don't, I don't even know if it applies all that much, but I know one time when I played on a ball team and we were in a tournament and there was a break and we could all go for lunch and all the guys decided they wanted to go to a strip, a strip bar. I didn't want to go, so I just stayed behind. And I'm not going to say it was persecution, it wasn't. To be absolutely truth, they thought I was afraid of my wife and she'd find out. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is I just didn't want to be a part of that. And it was a bit of a joke to the other guys that there's poor Jim back at the ballpark waiting for everybody to return from their happy time. But, you know, there are those who are persecuted because of righteous decisions. It can, and the beautiful thing is theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Who were before you. In a way, I think this elevates us to a special position in life because for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're now that place. We're now in that place where we're going to proclaim boldly that we're believers in Jesus Christ. So this is wonderful, and that's how we should be. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise your blessed name. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And if I clumsily delivered it, the good news is this, that your word will not come back void. And I've done a lot of scriptures here, Lord. 
So touch the hearts of everybody who's tuned in that we'll all get something out of this. And we thank you, Lord, for being our God. I'd just like to end with this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Philippians 4, 4-8. Thank you very much. God bless.